The astrolabe is an ancient astronomical computer that has many uses, including, as told to us by Wikipedia, locating and predicting the positions of the sun, moon, planets, and stars, determining local time, giving local latitude, and vice versa, surveying, and triangulation. The astrolabe was used during classical antiquity, the Islamic Golden Age, the European Middle Ages, and the Renaissance for all of these purposes. The early astrolabe was supposedly invented by Apollonius of Pergab around 220 BCE, which means that the astrolabe has been prevalent throughout history for over 2,000 years. Astrolabes can be purchased or built today and can be used with precision on our modern night skies. We are going to watch a brief clip from a video given at a TED conference about the astrolabe, its history, uses, and functionality. You can find the complete video on the official TED Talk site, and I would highly recommend watching the video in its entirety. So an astrolabe is relatively unknown uh, in today's world, but at the time, in the 13th century, it was the gadget of the day. It was the world's first popular computer, and it was a device that, is, in fact, is a model of the sky. So the different parts of the astrolabe in this particular type, the reet corresponds to the position of the stars, the plate corresponds to a, a coordinate system, and the mater has some scales and puts it all together. If you were an educated child, you would know how to not only use the astrolabe, you would also know how to make an astrolabe. And we know this because the first treatise on the astrolabe, the first technical manual in the English language, was written by Geoffrey Chaucer. Yes, that Geoffrey Chaucer in 1391 to his little Lewis, his 11-year-old son. And in this um, book, uh, little Lewis would, uh, would know the big idea. And the central idea that makes this computer work is this thing called stereographic projection. And basically the, the concept is how do you represent the three-dimensional image of the night sky that surrounds us onto a flat, portable, two-dimensional surface. The idea is actually relatively simple. Imagine that the Earth is at the center of the universe, and surrounding it is the sky projected onto a sphere. Each point on the surface of the sphere is mapped through the bottom pole onto a flat surface where it's then recorded. So the North Star corresponds to the um, center of the device. The ecliptic, which is the path of the sun, moon, and planets, correspond to an offset circle. The bright stars correspond to little daggers on the reet, and the altitude corresponds to the plate system. Now, the real genius of the astrolabe is not just the projection. The real genius is that it brings together two coordinate systems so they fit perfectly. There's the position of the sun, moon, and planets on the movable reet, and then there's their location on the sky as seen from a certain latitude on the back plate. So that's just one use. <laughs> it's incredible. Uh, there's probably 350, 400 uses. In fact, there's a text that has over a thousand uses of this first computer. On the back, there's scales and measurements for terrestrial navigation. You can survey with it. The city of Baghdad was surveyed with it. It could be used for calculating mathematical equations of all different types, and it would take a full university course to illustrate it. The astrolabe is a computer a calculator, a perfect measuring mechanism based on a geocentric, stationary model of the Earth. This piece of artistic and scientific brilliance needs no accolade, nor pomp or circumstance to announce its own craftsmanship, for its modern-day workability itself proves the genius of its design. A very profound question we must ask ourselves is, if the Sun is traveling at roughly half a million miles an hour, and the Earth rotates around it at roughly 66,000 miles an hour, how is it even possible to map and track the same set of stars for thousands of years? If we are to assume that the ancients created this calculator with a complete lack of understanding the true heliocentricity of our solar system, and merely created this calculator of the heavens as understood from their perspective and viewpoint, how is it possible they could have crafted such an instrument that maintains such precision over thousands of years? To somehow think that an instrument of such a high and accurate degree of calculability merely works today out of dumb luck or by accident, is rather obtuse. Whoever created this instrument, whatever culture or person made it, their knowledge and ingenuity has withstood the test of time. It would seem that the heavens and the working of its cycles have been known and measurable for a very, very long time. Yeah, bro. Yeah, it is, dude. The Earth's definitely flat. I've been researching for five years. Um, we came here, we got a uh, time lapse last night. And so you see the stars go in the perfect circle around it with Polaris in the middle. Y'all came here tonight.
Uh, a Foucault pendulum is a pendulum with a specially designed pivot, designed so that it can swing back and forth in any direction around the vertical. So that's in contrast to, for example, a grandfather clock, where the pendulum has to swing in a particular plane. Let's imagine that you have a Foucault pendulum and you're at the North Pole of the Earth. When you set the pendulum swinging, you determine a plane in which the pendulum is swinging. And that plane is fixed. So as the Earth rotates, the Earth rotates underneath the plane of the pendulum swinging. And so if you now go back and imagine that you're standing on the Earth, you see the plane of the pendulum rotate every 24 hours. Now as you go to lower latitudes away from the North Pole, the time that it takes the pendulum, the plane of the pendulum to rotate around lengthens. And in fact, at the equator, the plane doesn't rotate at all. At the latitude of Hanover, it takes 35 hours for the plane to rotate. So if you look at this pendulum here, if we look at it a few minutes from now, we won't even be able to detect that the plane of the pendulum swing has changed. But if you come back in an hour, uh, you will definitely see that it's moved a little bit. And if you come back in nine hours, this plane of this pendulum here will have rotated by 90 degrees, a very distinct change that you can easily see. The design of the Foucault pendulum is fairly simple. The pendulum is a heavy mass on the end of a very long chain, suspended so it can swing freely in any direction. And through this simple system, it is said that we are able to measure the rotation of the Earth. According to the heliocentric model, the atmosphere is said to spin with the Earth, and hence the air above and the ground below are a closed system, and thusly spin and are linked together as the Earth rotates. This science is well substantiated within the physics community, and this quote-unquote fact is not questioned. The entire mechanism and science behind the Foucault pendulum is based on the fact that the Earth spins below the pendulum, and the pendulum continues independently to spin on its own plane. The functionality of this machine flies directly in the face and is a complete contradiction to what is offered up in modern physics. No, we came here last night at 2 o'clock in the morning and did a Star Trail video where the stars are circling around and that's the North Star right there. It doesn't move. Oh it doesn't. my God. So, did you know that this thing, there's this hole right here? See that hole? It lines up with Polaris, the North Pole Star. All year, if you look at nighttime through up on the other side, that hole goes up and then the North Pole Star is right in the middle and it happens year round. Uh, this is actually proof that the Earth is a flat, stationary Earth. And that's why this, this costs hundreds of thousands of dollars to build, yeah. right? This is what they want for the New World Order, of course. Yeah. But the point is, they know what the Earth is, right? This thing wouldn't work if the Earth was spinning a thousand miles an hour, shooting 66,000 miles per hour around the sun. It literally wouldn't work. It gets even worse though, guys. On the side here, you can it's actually a calendar. So if you see this right here, this is a calendar. So if you look through this, you can track the sun every day throughout the year. There's a certain year where it will be right in the middle on the solstice. It's a calendar. Okay, they buried a time capsule over here. Yeah, and it tells you all about the astronomical abilities of it, right? This is some crazy stuff. So channel through stone indicates celestial pole that's the little hole that you see the north star through every day for all for thousands of years horizontal slot indicates annual travel of sun which is that right there which is how you get the solstice sunbeam through the capstone marks noontime throughout the year there's a slit in the top if you when it's exactly 12 o'clock the sun will be right in the middle of it this is because the sky does the same thing and resets every year that this will always be accurate that's why I spent hundreds of thousands of dollars building it or it would be a waste of money, right? It would only be right one year or something. So, pretty wild stuff, man. And of course, the top right here, Babylonian cuneiform. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. So that's that's when everyone had one language. Mm -hmm. And then it broke up. That's what this is all about. Babylon, one language. It breaks up into all these other languages. Down there are the modern languages, which are what the eight are printed on. And they say, on the English translation, unite the entire world with a single living language. They want to go back to Babylon, bro. Okay, now this socket joint thing is rather interesting. Uh, about a year or two ago, I went to the Griffith Observatory in Hollywood. And, uh, you know, it's a pretty famous observatory. It's been in a lot of movies and stuff like that. It's the one up on the mountain across from the Hollywood sign. And, uh, of course, when you, as soon as you walk in, immediately, as soon as you walk in the door, it, it's a, a, a dome, sort of like the Capitol Dome. 
in Washington, D.C., and it's lined with paintings of science mixed with pagan gods. So there's your first clue <laughs> right off the bat. You got science mixed with pagan false gods, which I would contend are um, fallen angels, Nephilim, demons. You know, they fall into that category. All right, so just below the dome there, you have uh, probably one of the more famous Foucault pendulums here in the United States. Now, listen to what the tour guide had to say about how this thing works. If you're wondering how we keep it going, we keep it going with an electromagnet. Otherwise, due to air friction, it would slow down. We'd have to jump in there every hour or so and give it a push. But our electromagnet keeps it going even after we close at night. It keeps going and going and uh, swinging back and forth even after we close. Because there's an electromagnet gently pushing this, overcoming the laws of gravity and wind resistance. Otherwise, the pendulum would slow down and stop spinning. So, otherwise someone would have to go down there, like when it was originally invented, and keep pushing the pendulum every so often to keep it in motion. Otherwise it would slow down, and every 15 minutes we'd have to go down there and push 240 pounds of brass to keep it in motion. So, there's some kind of magnet making that thing move? In the ceiling, there's a blue ring up there. You want to look up there? The magnet is helping overcome the force of gravity, keeping this pendulum in motion. Otherwise, it would slow down and stop like the smaller model that we'll do here in a short time. Sorry. Cool. Thanks. So I wanted to do a video on something called a Foucault pendulum. You also hear it called a Foucault pendulum. Um, these are pendulums that are uh, supposed to demonstrate the spin of the earth, but not everyone realizes that they actually have a magnetic uh, drive um, plugged into electricity uh, that keeps them moving. Now, um, the only reason I know this is because I worked for a construction company that installed one. So I just wanted to uh, do some mathematics real quick. Um, if this astrolabe could work on both the flat earth and the, and the globe, well, let's do some math. If every single latitude is 69 miles apart, if you were to put all those latitudes in a row, so we got 90 latitudes from the North Pole to the equator, that would make a radius of 6,210 miles, right? Because 69 times 90 is that answer. If you were to try to figure out the circumference, it's 2 times pi times the radius, which would give you an, an equator of 38,998.8 miles. 38,000. 998.8 miles that makes the edge of the earth if it's at 90 degrees south right that would make a radius of 12,420 miles and a circumference of 77,997.6 miles so how would this astrolabe work below the equator if it was you know, able to work on two grid coordinates, if each latitude is 69 miles apart. See what I'm saying? I don't know. I'm a nerd, man. I love math. So that's just what I was wanting to bring everybody's attention. You know, the Earth is flat. If, if the uh, distance between the uh, uh, latitudes is, is accurate, then according to the math, that's what it is. It's not 24,901 miles at the equator, like they say. And this astrolabe was built well before they were talking about a globe. This astrolabe was built before Jesus Christ was on the earth. 280 BCE or something like that, or 220 BCE? I'll give you 200. Whatever. You know what I mean?